I got an email sent to me after listening to one of the episodes on this podcast from what appears to be a very helpless husband. It was a very, very, very long email. And they'd said that one of the conversations we'd had on this podcast about menopause at one point had really helped them. But the key question that remained for that person was, when does a supporting partner know how and really at what point to help? Because, you know, no male partner wants to turn around to their wife and go, I think you've got menopause and starts diagnosing them. But they also don't want to just sit back and be quiet. I think you, it usually begins with something you can't quite put your finger on. She's reacting differently. She's not as resilient as she used to be. She's not managing situations the same way. And I think once we start taking the shame and the stigma out, him suggesting that perhaps this is menopause will not cause her to fly off the handle. I think, you know, normalizing this conversation, removing the stigma, it might make everyone go, oh, I mean, I didn't realize it in myself. You know, I thought it was grief related. And and I was like, wait, when was my last period? When was my last period? Uh, oh, I think I'm in menopause. I mean, I was, and then I was like, oh God, menopause. You know, even for myself, it was such a negative connotation. I had that sex in the city episode in my head when Samantha thought she was in menopause and how horrible it was for her. And then it turns out she wasn't and everything was better again. And I'm like, gosh, is this, you know, first of all, I applaud him for wanting to try to do something because so many, you think women don't understand what's going on. And so- one, bravo for wanting to be helpful. Two, say it with love. Say it gently. Let's, and then find a provider or find a healthcare provider to go in and start the conversation. And I, one of my be- my best visits with my patients are when their partners come and that the conversation is held together. And it really opens their minds, you know, to what's going on in her body and helps understand like what we can do therapeutically, what needs to be done at home. This is a special time for her. She's going to need extra help. We're going to get through this. You know, it doesn't have to destroy your sexual life or your relationship or whatever. It definitely can take a toll if left untreated. But, you know, bless him for doing it. Like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, there's probably a fair amount of dissolutions of relationships because no one's talking about this process and what it could do to someone. This might be a really stupid question, um, but I'm no, (laughs) I'm no, uh, I ask a lot of stupid questions. Do men go through anything like this? So there's a lot of debate about menopause. Um, The short answer is not really. We see men's testosterone levels peak at about age 19. No shocker there. And then this very slow kind of downtick until they stabilize at about age 35 to 40, and then they stay stable for the rest of their lives. But there's a difference between, in, there's a big variation from man to man where the cur- the shape of the curve looks the same. But as far as normal men's range is from 236 to about 1,000. So there's a big, you know, man-to-man variation. And there is a lot of men who are supplementing when they come in on the low end and they're feeling a lot better. Now, this is not my area of expertise. This is not, you know, I just read a lot of this research, you know, on testosterone and men are included in it. And so they are finding that they are having better cognition, feeling better, having more energy, et cetera. But there is no menopause their testicles don't stop working. I mean, it would be as if your testicles shriveled up and died at 51. That's the equivalent. Gosh. I do have to say, at the start of this conversation, when you said if that was happening to men, the reaction would be different. I have to say, I think I agree. I think that because it's one side of the population, I think it's kind of been overlooked over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it was and men or both genders, I think it would be a different response. And so much of what women were going through in menopause were dismissed as psychological. Mm. And I really had m- multiple times in their life, you know, it's all in her head. We never said it's all in his head. That's not a thing. 
on the warts. You know, it's all in her head was very much alive and well in my training and along a lot of my practice. I, I find myself now even having to pull myself back a little bit just because that was ingrained so much to always look for the psychological reason. I mean, women, a woman right now in 2023 is more likely to be prescribed an antidepressant for her menopause than hormone therapy. Multiple reasons for that. The way we were trained, the way we were taught to, to approach a woman's medical issues, and also the fear, uh, unfounded fear around the Women's Health Initiative and what it did to you know, physicians feeling confident about prescribing hormone therapy. Is there anything else that you do on a day-to-day -day basis in your life that um, you, we haven't talked about yet? Is there any sort of apps or yeah. tools? So or? I really like Headspace. I know there's some good meditation apps. I really thought meditation was woo-woo and not anything that, you know, I, I would just sit there and, and my brain would be bouncing all over the place. But once I went through menopause and suffered so horribly from the mental side effects and the death, you know, all of this happening at once uh, to me with my brother's death, aging parents, teenage girls in the house, you know, and realized something's got to give. And so I hired like a counselor, you know, I went to therapy and she recommended um, getting an app to help guide me through meditation. And that has really turned the needle for me. Really? Yeah. How? I, you know, carving out that it's just five or 10 minutes in the morning to think of what I'm grateful for, focus on that gratitude, you know, and I love teaching that to patients and to my followers of, of really putting yourself first. You know, the thought of you have to put your own oxygen mask on mm -hmm. first before you can go take care of your family and all the other things on your plate and just giving my brain that time to just relax and let it flow and just let the thoughts, you know, and just focus on, on me for that. That's really made a huge difference for me. I remember a woman in my life who went, whose behavior changed around this age. And I didn't know about perimenopause or menopause. It's in hindsight now that I look back and go, oh my God, everyone around this person thought they had bipolar or something. Right. I mean, it, it, it's probably contributing to divorce rates, maybe in a good way, you know, at this time. I, I, one of the positive things I see about menopause is that women are cutting the things in their life that don't make sense anymore. They're not putting up with, you know, as a society, we tend to take on everyone's burden and, um, you know, take on the emotional labor in a lot of relationships, take on the organizational labor. And I see because they're struggling so much with just staying afloat, they're able to just quickly say no. I'm not doing this anymore. You know, you need to pick up whichever relationship they're in. You need to pick up your, your end of the bargain here. You know, I can't do all of the organizational labor, the emotional labor. And I've, I have a patient who's a divorce attorney and she said, I really think a significant percentage is of this divorce is menopause. And either they're prioritizing what's important to them or they're not getting the support that they need. And... How can we give them the support that they need? So I think it's important that we talk about it. I encourage every single patient I have, all my followers on social media, tell your story. Tell your story to anyone who will listen. Tell your daughters, tell your nieces, tell your sons, tell your loved ones. Like make this a normal part of the conversation so that we see it coming, we understand what might happen and that no one feels crazy and alone when they're going through it. And then we need to do a much better job in our medical system of providing support for these women in whatever way they need it, be it hormones, non-hormones, cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, there's lots of things that we can do. Not just hormone therapy is not the cure-all for everything. We have to support the whole toolkit, right? We have to prioritize our sleep get the exercise that we need, focus on strength training. When a lot of us in my generation never did that, we were aerobics, you know, focused on being thin and small. It's time to be strong. You know, this muscle mass that you have is going to determine your longevity and your functionality as you age. And menopause is, you know, that loss of estrogen and testosterone is tearing our muscle units apart, which is leading to osteoporosis as well. I want to go through that whole two toolkit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also want to just, before we move there, understand why women don't 
sometimes communicate that they're going through perimenopause or menopause? What is the, is there a stigma associated with talking about I, it? Yeah, I think there's shame and stigma associated with aging, with females aging. And then you're, you're layering on this loss of fertility. And in the medical field, when you look at funding in the U.S. for research studies, women's health, like I think it's 55 billion, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., you know, for all research studies. And that's outside of what pharma is funding. And women's health gets about 15 billion. And the majority of that is spent on getting people pregnant, keeping them pregnant, you know, and fertility issues. Menopause gets, I think, 15 million. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's like 0.03%, if I did the math correctly, of all, you know, are we not as important as we were when we were fertile? Do, do our lives not matter? It's ridiculous to me. And when how, we can intervene and help and ha give these women a longer life and a better quality of life. And how many women is that? I know we said a, it as a fraction earlier on or a percentage, but that's like, I think in your book I read it's 1.2 billion women by the end of this year. Yeah. And there's what, 47 million new entrants into the sort of perimenopausal, postmenopausal right. category every year. 1.2 billion. Billion. Right. And how, and so many of them have no education at their fingertips, have nowhere to turn, are, you know, 85% are going in to their healthcare provider's office complaining, help me, and being turned away and leaving with more questions and answers. And only 10% are even having the discussion for hormone replacement therapy. And then if they're given it, they're so terrified because of the misrepresentation of the Women's Health Initiative, they're convinced they're going to get cancer. And that, that study's been completely dismantled and walked back. We have good information that came out of that study. But, you know, the, the, pro, the, the thought that estrogen causes breast cancer is the worst thing that came out of that study because it's not true. If you had a, a megaphone and you could speak to every woman right now, the 1.2 billion that we talked about earlier that are in that perimenopausal or the menopausal phase or postmenopausal, and you had to communicate one message to them. And I'm actually going to bring in everybody else as well, because although it's just those women I've mentioned, everyone around them in their life probably needs to hear some somewhat similar message so they can play supporting roles in that individual struggle. What would you say down that menopause to those women and the, their loved ones? So my mantra is menopause is inevitable. Suffering is not. But you're going to have to advocate for yourself because... Society has failed us. Our medical system is, is built to fail the menopausal woman. And there is good help out there. You're going to have to do the legwork. I've got tons of resources on my website to help you. You know, lists of articles to print out and hand to your doctor, system, you know, um, uh, symptomatic sheets that you can like keep track, journals that you can hand to your physician. Um, any way that I can help you advocate for yourself, because I can't be everyone's doctor, but that this is real. You're not crazy. This is happening and there are lots of things that we can do, even non-hormonal. Don't feel like if you're not a candidate for hormone therapy that you're stuck. You know, exercise, nutrition, other pharmacology, stress reduction, sleep. It's time to take care of yourself first so that you can have the best end of your life that you deserve. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.